Um, uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is uh, Hassan Bahtimi, and I'm a senior lecturer at the War Studies Department. I'm also the research theme lead for science, technology, health, and security in the School of Security Studies. The theme combines researchers and academics working at the intersection between science, technology, and security politics, including um, health and conflict. Um, I'm very pleased we have today Fauzia Gibson Fall, who will talk about her recently published article in RIS, Review of International Studies. It's a British International Studies Association. Um, Fauzia is pursuing a doctorate degree in the Queen Mary University, London, where she researches the role of African militaries in global health. Um, she is a well-known um, face at King's. Uh, she spent some time here doing her master's, but also she was teaching fellow uh, before joining uh, Queen Mary to start her PhD. Um, I'm also pleased we have uh, Gemma Bauscher, who will be our discussant for today. Gemma is um, a researcher in the Conflict and Health Research Group at King's, in addition to being a medical doctor. Um, Gemma is also writing her PhD. Uh, her topic is on antimicrobial resistant, resistance in contemporary uh, conflicts. Um, we will start by handing off the, on the floor to Fauzia, who's going to speak for about 15, 20 minutes about her paper, sharing some of the key uh, and core ideas and arguments. Um, we will then have comments or questions, thoughts, reflections from Gemma. And then we will open it up for uh, comments. Uh, please note that the event is uh, recorded, um, hopefully successfully, um, and will be made available later on the department's YouTube uh, channel. If you have any questions, um, please use the raise hand function um, or uh, use the Q&A uh, channel that you'll find at the bottom of, of, your, of your screen. Um, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us today and looking forward to um, the talk and the discussion. And I hand over the floor to Fauzea. Thank you so much, Hassan. And thank you for having me um, and for inviting me to, to present my work. It's uh, really an honor to be amongst you both. It's just a pleasure and an honor. Um, and I'm seeing some really familiar um, names in the audience. So I really thank you for, for coming um, today as well. I really look forward to our conversation. Um, and so let me dive right in. Um, so the paper looks at worldwide documented instances of military engagements in the first six months of the COVID-19 pandemic. And it doesn't aim to be an all encompassing uh, or comprehensive review per se. What I venture to do is to untangle and situate these engagements um, amid contemporary understandings of military actors in global health. And to do so, I highlight issues of continuity, change and resistance in using militaries as health actors in emergencies, but also in kind of everyday healthcare um, policy and delivery. And militaries as health actors, um, you'll know as much as me, have been somewhat understudied in international relations. Um, but I think this scholarship, um, but, but I, what I tried to do, sorry, is to try to link the scholarship that we do have to the current instances in order to open some possibilities for future empirical and eventually theoretical avenues. And I understand military practices as co-constituted at global, regional, and local levels. Um, through foreign and domestic interventions. And I, I, I highlight the kind of long institutional roots of some of these practices, um, which have often been um, obscured or blurred through dichotomies between civilian and, 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 military, and military realms. Um, but I also acknowledge that this historical continuum linking health and military actors um, is also exacerbated by contempor the contemporary rise of the global health security paradigm um, and strategic agendas, mostly within defense um, policies. Um, and, and these instances have kind of deepened and diversified military global health mandates. And this historical continuum, which links militaries and health practices is exacerbated um, through pivotal events at both international and local levels. We can think, for instance, of the Zika 2018 um, epidemic in, in, in Brazil and elsewhere, and or the 2014-16 West African Ebola ep epidemic, which kind of remain seminal examples of this process. Um, 
whereby militaries have undertaken what, what is often deemed as central roles um, in the responses. And the coronavirus pandemic most obviously uh, stands as a pivotal event in global health civil military relations, and it brings urgency to establishing common definitions and frames of references uh, in frames of references to apprehend health related military engagement in all its complexity. And I also stress in the paper and in my current work, my current research work that um, at the nationals level, especially in low and middle income countries. Uh, militaries have often historically filled the gaps in under-resourced health systems, and these extensive health-related um, routine roles in particular remain widely understudied. And I think um, somehow that this has particular repercussions for the inadequacy of, of available international guidelines, and, but also for our, our inability to link, uh, to think, sorry, creatively, preventively, and, and perhaps responsibly um, about these, these interactions. In the paper, I also summarize um, issues of resistance to this phenomenon, whereby people-centered rights-based um, perspectives have also have often um, offered alternative to traditional conceptions of security in the health realm, um, and how these community-focused public health approaches tend to caution against military involvement. Um, which are often deemed detrimental to delivery outcomes. Um, and this form of resistance to military involvement in health relates to specific areas of concern, um, often thought to be inflating geopolitical tensions or community uh, suspicion, et cetera. So on the other side, um, obviously proponents of military engagement in public health will see coherence in aligning security mandates with wider societal goals. Um, here, the inclusion of the military and wider health sector capability is seen as more efficient and a more holistic take on stake um, capacity as a whole, right? Less, less silos, more, more synergy. And amid the pandemic, these visions are clashing and governmental responses are likely to be in parts guided by these kind of differing um, securitized biomedical or people-centered approaches um, to public health. And, and, and this has a knock-on effect on, on military involvement. And I highlight some knowledge gaps. So what do we not know? Um, this is a very murky research arena. We know very little about the outcome of military and health engagements in practice. Um, prior to the pandemic, militaries have often prioritized global health engagements while failing to gather or publish evidence um, of whether they do in fact legitimize their own presence overseas, but also whether they, they advance specific health targets to some extent in that debate. So. Um, and the, the paper also highlights some of the, difficult, the, the, the difficulties, so some of the issues relating to conducting civil military health research from, from the civilian side also. Um, so the absence of forums, and this is quickly changing, but we've had three years kind of an, an absence of forum connecting both sectors um, in a research, and, and King's is definitely not, it's not, definitely not the case at King's um, in the last couple of years, but there has been a kind of gap in, on that front. Um, and there's also, I think we can observe a dissimilitude in research ethos um, and intentions from both sides. Um, and so what the paper does is that it offers avenues to apprehend and study military involvement um, in health going forward. And so I, I kind of um, unpack three main uh, trends identified in the first six months of the Ebola pandemic, of the, sorry, the coronavirus pandemic. Um, the first trend relates to minimal technical military support. So this trend emerged amid um, deliberately civilian-led and operationalized responses. These responses um, have intentionally limited military involvement to very niche, very technical, specific um, support of the, of the civilian response. And in these settings, um, specialized and sporadic military involvement um, have often remained unused in those first couple of months. Obviously, that tends to change. And I think these trends are kind of uh, moving. They're not completely static. Countries will move around the ladder, let's say. Um, but but they are all kind of these instances where the military wasn't required. Um, and there's also, but 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 I think it's quite uh, fair to say that it was extremely widespread that most, if not the, almost all countries in the world have deployed some level of capacity. Um, and then there's these kind of rare ex exceptions. You can think about the Indian state of Kerala or most obviously Costa Rica, which doesn't have um, 
a military but has a police force um, and so but in most of the responses in the first trend um you can observe a kind of legacy of primary healthcare service investments and um, adequately trained personnel centralized management systems and also proactive leadership um, the second and by far the most widespread um, trend would be this idea of a blended civil military response to COVID-19. Um, this is the most common operation, types of operations, and they, they're also very varied. So um, amid blended responses, national militaries take part in population-facing population activities in parallel to or embedded within civilian-led responses. Um, civil military hospital capacity is also a central component of this trend. Um, and, and if some regional commonalities are identified, countries will also exhibit stock differences in subnational experiences, right? As we've seen in the US, for instance. Um, so features and characteristics of, of these blended involvements are also wide ranging um, in military enforcement of pandemic measures um, has taken hold in, in low middle income countries where you had kind of dense uh, urban populations who would rely on subsistence economies. And in these settings, militaries enforce lockdown through various um, often coercive measures. And then we have a third trend um, and, an, and quite an interesting one, which is this, um, the fact that in some settings, the military has taken the leadership of the entire COVID-19 response. And this also emerged in countries displaying some level of blended civil military responses and um, that then quickly shift towards military leadership and military political leadership of the response um, itself. And shifts in, in balance of power of already kind of hybrid political systems um, or systems with heavy military influence are intensifying amid um, COVID-19 responses. And so the discussion bit of the paper will kind of um, identify civil military pathways. And I, I, I then summarize the multitude of confounding factors which underpin um, the types of governmental responses. I think comparisons amid the pandemic have been detrimental in many ways. Um, but these include, and, and these confounding factors will include um, obvious, obvious things like political systems, um, levels of institutional capacity, political legitimacy, um, justice system, media freedom, media reliability. Um, and so extremely context specific national and regional experiences will constitute new sets of norms and practices linking health um, and defense institutions. Levels of military involvement in health also vary according to contagion level and um, political climates and institutional legacies and other factors um, such as the density of the population and um, the competency of state leaders or, or, or lack of um, and of health ministers will also influence the recourse to, to, to the military. But when we look at these responses as a whole, um, we start seeing patterns and political shifts whereby militaries take on vacuum feeling roles, um, so a pull factor. Um, they're invoked to respond to identified um, needs, but they also position themselves to eventually acquire further control um, as part of the responses. And in light of these three level of participation to so these three trends, um, it appears that the recourse to military is threefold. And I and and this is through this this um, these kind of ABC almost these three ways. So the first is that it allows um, it, it follows a country's historical legacy in civil military relations and perceptions of um, military delivery. B uh, or or secondly, you can think that these involvements occur to fill gaps when systems are are overwhelmed. This is universal, and um, it follows contagion threats level uh, and the health system's ability to cope with the the epidemic pressure. This is also a gradual post process, which is more widespread in states with weaker health systems, um, or where the military has historically run uh, civilian facing services. In certain contexts, however, there's also a push factor occurring whereby militaries will position themselves as responder. Um, and this is not necessarily marshaled through uh, centralized decision making and will create tensions with and, and, and um, the wider kind of state civil military relations. And lastly, and importantly, it appears that a country's public health approach, so in, that that includes um, not exclusively, but definitely includes top-down kind of pandemic 
preparedness or delivery frameworks when they exist. And um, this, this kind of public health approach will influence the recourse to military means. And when adopting securitized biomedical responses, countries with weaker um, health systems will need to recourse to top down often military means. And in COVID-19, these responses are marshaled through the military to enforce measures um, that you now know um, really well. So measures such as lockdown surveillance and border control and contact tracing. And in these contexts, the ability to command um, through military means in the health realm remains a double-edged sword. Um, it allows for stringent responses, but it can also threaten citizenship rights and community trust in um, that is so crucial um, in epidemics. And so to conclude, uh, I'm almost running out of time. So we urgently need to know more about the impact of these involvements. Do they make people feel safe, safer? Do they impact on health seeking behavior? Um, we need to understand case variability and context specificity. And what is really clearly starting to show is that direct and indirect involvements of the military in COVID-19 and national responses have led to an increase in policy and practice linking military and health actors. Um, all these involvements are fomenting new COVID-19 related civil military assemblages, which is a literature we know in, in IR, but I think is as um, really you know, we'll, should really pick up in this area, um, which will influence future local and global civil military relations. Um, and this could have a normative impact, further entrenching militaries as common actors um, in the health realm. And so we really need as, as Global Health and IR scholar um, to focus on the ways in which civilian institutional lacunas are compensated through military means. Um, and this will allow for a, a better societal resilience and um, for future emergency responses. So this was my, um, my paper. I still encourage you to, um, to read it if you're interested or if you want to, um, to get in touch later or yeah, or collaborate or um, X, Y, and Z. But yeah, I, over to you, Dr. Bauscher. Bauscher, thank you so much. That was a, a fantastic presentation and, and it hardly needs saying that it's on such a timely subject, which is so important. And I'm really thrilled that we can kind of talk about it whilst it's unfolding before us. And I think that's, that's really my first impression is that you know, the speed that you managed to get this paper out to actually capture and witness this phenomenon of something really pivotal that's happening around us right at the at the time that it happens is is amazing um and i think it's really useful because what you've done is give us a really effective framework of thinking about this phenomenon and of course you, you mentioned rightly the long historical roots of the trend um but i think you know those of us who remember the ebola epidemic that you know you mentioned 2014 to 16 i think we can recall the the hand wringing around the issues of civil military engagements in global health missions and and in some ways it's been interesting to watch this, the sort of the events around covid where in many ways the, the response at the domestic scale has been sort of unprecedented but also has swept up unawares on governments managing their domestic responses uh, and i think you know you talk about this concept of vacuum filling and I think we can see actually, especially in that second category that you talk about, the, the sort of the, the coming to the rescue of civil military actors and particularly military actors um, to prevent critical system failure and this overwhelming of health services. So I, I wonder if that might be a good point for us to jump off in our discussion. You know, this week we've, we've seen a lot of discussion around um, people calling on the government to launch an inquiry and a lessons learned exercise in the UK. And I wonder if from the work you've done for this paper, whether you have any impressions about the key takeaways for policymakers working and, and thinking about the future of civil military engagements in health emergencies, what, what you think would be valuable to take away from this experience? So, so um, your question is many fold, Gemma, and I wonder if, it, if it's only UK based or, or just generally, I think we are so terrible at gathering data. We are so terrible. I mean, we, you know, you're talking about how it was talked about quite widely after the Ebola outbreak, but actually what came out of the Ebola outbreak in terms of report, in terms of literature, very little was, um, you know, centered around experiences on both sides, right? There was a couple of papers and for instance, I, I can think of a couple in the BMJ military and a couple of reports like the Saving Life reports, but we really lacked comprehensive reviews. We lacked um, an understanding of how this was experienced in communities at local level. Um, some anthropologists have done some work, but I can think of two or three, um, you know, papers. So I think we're, we're not very good at this area of study. Um, and I think it, it, you know, and we will 
possibly get better because COVID is kind of forcing us to do so. But these pivotal moments also kind of skew routine everyday practices, right? And so we get these kind of, and I think in the UK, we need to have a real fundamental review of the way we function um, in COVID, but also generally um, on that front. So yeah, so data gathering, more qualitative research also, because I think it's fine to do, it's great to do kind of technical reports, but actually we do need, as academics, we do need to start gathering qualitative data or mixed methods. And, I, and we can talk about methodologies, but we, we yeah. Um, did I answer well, your question? I think Emma, you did, you did. Questions. And I think that's a, that's a, I think that's a good, um, that kind of picks up on a point you raised about the, you know, this idea of continuity and actually picking up on perhaps use, using our methods in social sciences perhaps to address that issue. I mean, I'm interested to understand what you understand by continuity in the context of civil military engagement. So this is a really good question. I think, again, the issue of continuity, especially in LMICs, so we can do reports about our, our own, you know, the NHS functioning, etc. But I think we really fail to ask question, especially in the civil military arena globally, there's such a failure to look at everyday interactions, but also at crisis interactions in low middle income countries. So you've got militaries like the Pakistani military, the Senegalese military that I'm working on at the moment, um, which have had extensive roles, very prominent since the 60s and beyond, right? These are colonial institutions that carried through. And so we know very little about the way you know this is happening. Um, and so historical methods, for instance, but also just just going in country and understanding what how our people um, and processes functioning, I think would carry a huge amount of weight for us. And I mean, maybe COVID is, is opening this idea, right, in general, and the fact that we've done pretty terribly and therefore some in some settings that were less resource have done, you know, I, I don't want to be, you know, um, blunt, but some some less poor set settings seem to have done better for a myriad of reasons and we can't you know blow our horn too early but there but there is that kind of need to look for self um explanations i think and and to look at the so-called periphery and try to understand how some of these processes are happening elsewhere and that continuity elsewhere uh, that's i think that's a very interesting point and i think that kind of brings the sort of the was the, the I dare to call it the traditional global health actors into the frame as well. And I think it is, it is, you've mentioned this, this comes along, you know, you have the, the health system strengthening approaches within global health agendas, and you also have the ascendance of global health security. And I wonder how you see these sort of respective actors um, engaging with each other over the, the, the coming periods. Uh, and obviously there's great diversity in context, but you know, we seem to have a clash of agendas in some settings around this. And you talk about resistance to, to civil military responses. Um, and I think that issue of resistance is gonna be really fertile over the next few years. How do you see that playing out? Again, I think we're in the dark. So the, both of these agendas are pushed without having concrete manifestations of why they are, right? So the, I think the resistance exists for reasons that are really valuable. And we, I'm, I'm currently doing interviews um, with practitioners on the civilian side and the military side. And I think some of the resistance and some of the examples that are captured within those narratives of resistance are really important and haven't been, I haven't read them anywhere and they're really worrying. So this, this kind of aversion to it um, has roots and has, you know, has, um, um, deep ramifications and perhaps um, very worrying, you know, I think some of these practices need to be um, looked at in more depth. I think something like the COVID-19 pandemic is really showing that, that the, you know, the limits of the security frame in terms of explaining some of the health outcomes, right, especially in the UK, for instance, but elsewhere. So the, the inequalities that underpin um, the health outcomes that we're seeing necessitate better adapted responses. That, and, and I think there's a limit to, um, the security frame in that manner um, but yeah so but but I do think that we uh, we just we need more information and we need to to sit down I think there's been such a lack of forum um, and this is changing and that's brilliant. Mm. I mean I think it's really interesting you raise that kind of the limitation in our current framings and obviously as, as academics that's a challenge isn't it uh, you know it has make, makes us think about you know, what what theoretical avenues we might have to interrogate this. I mean, you know, there's obviously securitization is a kind of classical theory of this, but I wonder what you think are productive advances in, in the sort of the theoretical approaches we can use from various academic sectors to appreciate the problem and, and the challenges. Yeah, that's a good, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm 
battling with that at the moment myself. Um, this piece was consciously not, you know, theoretical per se. I didn't want to use um, militarization, normalization. I didn't want to go into that um, categorization per se. But I think some of this, some of our tools are really lacking. And so, for instance, I think securitization, which has been our go-to to explain these phenomena in global health, is really hard, you know, really struggles to understand some of these dynamics that are happening in the everyday, right? Military, again, militaries have kind of routine roles, not necessarily invoked through a trickle-down effect um, of, or a process of securitization. So I think it's, it often tends to skew our understanding of certain martial politics at an institutional level and at delivery level. Um, so, so these approaches need to be rethought. Um, and I'm, I'm, I think the idea of militarization, for instance, in, in IR also hasn't been um, thought through in the health realm much. And so I'm, I'm trying to do that at the moment um, for my own research, but also I think, you know, um, for instance, so things like, so I tried to do in the article to really try to stress that idea of the local and the global and the interconnectedness. And I think government, you know, government, more insights into the governance structures of these interactions and how they influence each other is really, really needed. So, um, yeah, multi-level analyses, governance analyses. That's great. And uh, you, you mentioned sort of how you, partly how you got into this and, and I, we, I know we've got lots of students watching. So I, I wonder if you could actually give us a broader look about how you actually came to this problem of, and this issue of civil military engagements in health emergencies. It's a unique issue that you're, you're hitting just the right time for. It's a cathartic question. I think I wrote this paper because it was the elephant in the room of my research, right? As you said, when you opened, it was that the, the fact that I had to make sense of what was coming out for me to to not think only in crisis mode and to try to then be able to address some of these questions more fundamentally. So I kind of almost got it in the way, out of the way of my own thinking. Um, and I got interested in this, in this probably most um, vividly by traveling in Sub-Saharan Africa and working in, in broadcasting at the time, but I would see you know, militaries doing everyday deliveries of cots and participating in within health systems in a way that I didn't think was documented and was fascinating and interesting. Um, and then when I then later came to academia, I realized that that was absolutely you know, lacking um, in sort of the body of work in, in global health. And so I got interested in this mainly from an African standpoint, um, but then I also got increasingly interested from a kind of global north standpoint because I couldn't teach it to students. I really struggled to find theoretical and empirical evidence to pass on some of these issues to, to students. And so I would build my courses around reports and, you know, but I, I just thought there was a, there was a gap there um, in terms of my teaching. And so my, yeah, my poor students over the years have had to carry on with me in the thinking and um, around these issues, yeah. Well, it, it's been a, a, a pleasure to kind of watch it because those of us who've known you for a long time have known your passion for this subject uh, going through the years. So it's great to see that you've kind of addressed the current challenge with this really fantastic paper. Um, I wonder actually if this is a good moment to open up discussion to the floor, Hassan. Um, yeah, excellent. Um, and I'd like to thank you so much, uh, Hosea, for, for your presentation and for your paper. Um, and also Gemma for this very interesting discussion. So let's remind everyone that you are most welcome to contribute. So if you feel you have a comment, and we already got a few, so I'm going to share them with um, Hosea and Gemma. If you have a comment or a question, feel free either to use the raise hand function and we can bring you into the discussion or write in the Q and A, and again, we'll bring that into the uh, discussion. Perhaps I will um, I'll start by a question that I had uh, going through the paper for and listening to you as well is, uh, which is actually one that perhaps, um, I mean, you're very specific in your paper, right? And, and I think you've captured very good, in a very good way, the you know the uh, that topology, and I think that is in itself something you know is is very thought provoking. Um, I, I wonder whether you specifically looking at the table that you had at the at the paper that I was very curious about the how does that pan out geographically? You know, the first thing that I started you know that I caught myself doing is try to actually make sense of this topology. Whether this is this cuts across north and south, cuts across well the different civil military relations, state capacity. So in terms of like what really explains, and I know that might be a big question. What really explains that variance in how these 
how the military sort of like interacted with the um uh, you know with it with policy responses to covid you know what in based on what you saw and again you were very specific in saying like this is only first six months so uh, i mean and that can be also something that perhaps also can be discussed like to what extent you see these trends uh sort of continuing uh, or something in the life cycle of the pandemic the different requirements of it that we might need a different configuration so 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 to, so to sum up like how do you think what do you think most explains that variance and i realize you know there might be just like a confluence of factors um but also looking ahead and i know this is research that you you've not done perhaps yet but do you, would you see it like this perhaps changing in a different phase of the pandemic or is or is it a reflection of something that is more institutional and structural and therefore will persist so i think this is such a good question and also multifaceted i think the, the topology in itself was again to try to untangle them and i think this will be done in so many various ways i think what i'm giving is a broad category of kind of a level almost a three level um, which helps us start to understand how they might have happened and i think that second category that civil military category is huge right and is experienced in so many different ways um and so in a way the topology kind of helped me um, make sense also of the kind of responses which didn't necessitate. Um, it kind of gives almost kind of a, a scale of where you don't necessitate and why is that, right? How is it? Is it because there's not the availability at, at, at military in terms of military preparedness or is it just that it's not needed? And as you said, there's so many factors which underpin um, these responses. And I think countries themselves will move along that category as, as the pandemic unfolds. And again, I wrote this paper in, I think it was the beginning of the summer. And so things have changed already since then, but I think the topology stays in which the scale, you know, countries will then move along the scale depending on contagion level um, and kind of political, you know, we see it in the UK with our, um, and I don't want to open that whole, um, you know, the two days ago uh, security review, but I think, you know, governments will change, their approaches will change, and therefore, you know, the manifestations um, domestically and internationally will also change, most obviously. But I think that topology kind of stays for me to understand, at least, and I don't know whether it will stick, but I think for me, it will stick definitely in that kind of um, an ability to be able to locate um, an incursion of the military within the civilian response itself, right? Um, and so whether countries would, um, yeah, would move along is, is is most obvious for me. So I gave the and I think in the in the first um, instance I talk about symbolic uh, military involvements, which I think are very important here and, and cut across all typologies. Right, the fact that and um, there's continuous discourse linking the military and the health realm, not only within kind of think tank, uh, you know, talking about the transferability of of military skills into the civilian sector, um, but also kind of the everyday media framing of of the pandemic. And so I think whether you know this is happening across the board and that typology doesn't necessarily inform the normative um impact that the, the pandemic will have for, for for that link um i see you even you're nodding but yeah so so and again so the example for instance of of, of canada where it was it, it, you know and and again the vaccination for instance is, is shifting that so in canada there was very little in, in military mm -hmm. And um, now the military has taken, you know, there's a certain leadership and vaccination rollout that was taken on later on after the paper was written. And so obviously there's, uh, there will be changes. Um, yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much, Fazea. So let me bring in some of the um, questions from our um, questions and comments from our attendees. And again, I encourage everyone, you're more than welcome sort of to uh, put your questions and we'll bring them to the panel. Um, either through the raise hand function um, or through the Q&A uh, channel. Um, um, so let me start by uh, uh, a question from Professor Preeti Patel. Um, so Pre Preeti writes, uh, I was one, I'm wondering if uh, there has been any work on the cost effectiveness of military health interventions in global health. Um, so what do you think about that? Um... I don't think so, Preeti, Professor Patel. Um, not that I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, I've reviewed for my PhD. I did a lit review, which you know um, had 150 articles, I think, and I can't think of any cost effectiveness study. I think there's such a there, there's definitely a need for more effectiveness 
um, study, there's also that difference between effectiveness and, and whether it's appropriate or not, right? And I think both of these realms really need to be approached um, consciously. So um, health, so um, economic effective, is it health effectiveness she's referring to? Uh, cost effectiveness. Cost e yeah, so cost effectiveness um, would be brilliant, but I haven't seen that. Ooh, I hope that doesn't exist. If it exists, please, please send it to me. Um, but I don't think I've seen that. I think that'd be, that'd be um, really interesting. Um, yeah. Great. Um, I have a question from uh, Riley Jones. Um, were there any notable uh, or any notable examples in your research that the public visibility of military intervention gave credibility to populations that have historically perceived weak central government? Uh, was it a mixed picture? Um, um, and thank you for your excellent presentation, excellent paper. Um, um, same question from, from Riley as well. Was there um, evidence of military intervention interacting in positive or negative ways with wider development themes in countries or regions? Support, ignore, disrupt? Um, so to, to, to answer the first question around, I think there is some level of, and again, it's very hard. We don't have any evidence of, of how populations experience this, right? So I'm only basing this on kind of secondary reports like media reports, etc. We know very little about how population, we need to have insights into how communities um, you know, are at the forefront of that, of, of receiving that care um, and or those services. And we, we know very little. I think there is obviously some level of, of, of gravitas, right, that comes with saying, well, you know, and this is very present in the securitization literature, where you make it the priority, you make it, you know, the, 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 the you make the health of the people, the, the governmental um, priority by involving military, right, because it's the last level of the state. And I think this is um, present in civil military conversations and in security um, literature. The problem we have is that we don't know. We don't know if it makes people feel safer. We don't know whether. Um, so I think we, we need to have much more insight into this. And this will, again, it's this idea um, that someone um, pointed to when I was conducting my interviews this month was saying, not on COVID, on, on my research in Africa, but was saying there's such a difference between effectiveness and appropriateness. And appropriateness is so context specific, obviously. Um, mm -hmm. And so in terms of um, notable examples, uh, giving credibility, I think there's definitely a signaling um, of credibility that can happen. It can also be detrimental to a government, uh, right? It can also make them look, especially in, in places that I look at in the third trend, in places where there is a civil military power balance already at play politically, it can be quite detrimental to governments um, when there seems to be an independent uh, take on from the military, right? Undermining the civilian response. So I think it's a, it's, um, it really depends um, context wise. And Riley asked um, positive or negative ways with wider development themes in countries or regions, support, ignore, disrupt. Was it evidence of intervention there? Um, difficult, again, we don't have enough information. I'm really looking forward to reading some of the reports, hopefully that will come out of, you know, but I think these will come out a year, in a year, in two years, where we're we're going to be able to see the wider impact. We're only starting to see the wider impact on COVID, right? We just had a paper, um, you know, the study that came out of um, Southeast Asia yesterday, showing the maternal and child um, mortality burdens. So we're just only seeing the wider implications. So I think before we're able to draw any conclusions um, of of that, will take a while. Um, excellent. Um... So another question from Bayard Roberts. Uh, thank you for a great presentation in Q&A. You highlighted the lack of research on this topic. I think that's a theme that comes across very clearly, um, that more needs to be done. Um, how could we strengthen co-production of research in this topic with actors uh, from affected countries? Bayard, um, Professor Roberts, that is an excellent question. Um, I think there needs to be more forums. There needs to be more practical forums. There are forums that exist. I can think of a, of a couple. Um, so you've got game exercises, military kind of participatory, civil military um, exercises, for instance, that have, um, for pandemic preparedness that have um, happened across the world um, in all big regions of the world. And so these are happening. I think we need to be, we need to start embedding research within, um, within those exercises, for instance, right? So 
where are the researchers at these meetings? Um, are they invited? Can they document? We need anthropologists. Um, you know, it'd be brilliant to have an, an ethnography of the next big um, interaction. And, I, and there is this, this, this issue of the fact that obviously um, a lot of this falls under defense and security, you know, defense policy. Um, and I'm, I'm, this is something I'm personally uh, working on at the moment. And of course, you know, you know that you need to navigate certain levels of secrecy um, in, those, in those instances. I think there needs to be, I don't know, I hope people, I hope one of the students attending will want to do a PhD about this and will you know, take on a regional outlook. I think there just needs to be an interest within scholars um, in NMICs and, and, and in the Global North on these issues. Uh, and I wonder whether, you know, collaborating has been difficult for, for very, you know, obvious ethos um, um, reasons for research that you see when you speak to, to, to both sides. Um, but I think there's an, such an urgency in, in collaboration. Um, yeah. Um, excellent. Thanks, Josea. Um, a very important question. It's from an anonymous attendee. Um, how, if at all, do gender women uh, peace and security narratives incorporate into this research? So this is a really good question. Um, so we know so the, the, the paper brushes on, touches upon this. And so we know that in the pandemic, women are disproportionately affected economically, socially, right? In the disruption of reproductive services, we know that they bear a bigger economic burden. Um, we also know that in post-conflict situations that the, the security discourse tends to play in gender vulnerabilities. This has been shown in Burundi and in certain settings. Um, so there is a kind of scholarly impetus to be very careful. Um, but also I find in my own research at the moment in terms of interviews that when I speak to people, I'm often very surprised by some of the some of the, you know, I was just talking about the secrecy and I don't want to give away my research stuff from the other side, but I think there's this idea of secrecy that can not necessarily be detrimental um, to things like reproductive rights, etc. We might be surprised when we ask the questions um, about military involvement in that some of the services might be um, more nuanced or more complex than than what would be the obvious kind of and you know anti-militaristic standpoint um and so yeah so I, I can see that there are vulnerabilities I need to be you know in the, the literature the feminist literature for instance and critical theory literature has make you know makes this very clear and I think we need to be able to involve that in our thinking but I also think we need to ask the questions in the first place um, and gather evidence gather evidence around um gender um, and gender exposure to, to military services and military measures in, in the health realm. Um, excellent. I have a question for you, um, Fosea, since, since you talked a lot, I mean, it's the thing that keeps coming up that we need to produce the data and sort of like do research and actually develop a research agenda. That's something that is unfolding um, as we speak, as in like, we've not seen the end of it. Um, I mean, hopefully we will at some point soon. Um, and the question is like how, like talk us through perhaps like how you did that research. Um, I mean, you talk about that in the paper, but I was hoping that we can squeeze maybe something more out of you uh, on that uh, in a discussion. Um, so, so, so you mentioned you were working uh, on it or you started working on it or you know, a big chunk of it was done over, over the summer. Um, so wh where, how did you get your uh, data uh, from? Um, what were some of the key sort of like challenges that you faced uh, then? You know, as researchers looking into something that is unfolding and sort of we're not really sure, I mean, in the summer, somewhere, somewhere sort of like in a misguided way, perhaps more optimistic than others. Um, but, but we're all engulfed into this kind of environment of uncertainty about it. How, how did you manage that with, with the research, researching an open-ended story? So I was really encouraged by my supervisor, Sophie Hammon and Kate Hall at Queen Mary to make sense of the data, that the, the great literature that was coming out of the COVID up. And they really followed up with me. And I think they were very good at keeping me on track in terms of 
knowing my limits with what I could do with that sort of, of data as well. So, you know, this is mainly based, based on gray literature. So it's Google searches, like a lot of reports that are going to come out, you know, before we have those conversations and we, we sit down and we, we have, you know, um, internal reports on, on, on various ends. I think a lot of us will be doing Google searches, right? And so that's what I was doing frantically um, in the sunshine in the summer. Um, very thankfully, um, grateful for having the ability to do that. But I was really supported um, um, by my supervisor to also not necessarily, you know, put the, in French you say, put the carriage in front of the, I don't know, uh, an, an, an the horse. Well, there we go. Um, so this idea of not having, you know, not necessarily needing to draw any theoretical conclusions mm. from this, right? And 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 to stay humble in my ability to make sense of the data, of the, the data that was coming out and unfolding. And I think there is um, a sense of wonderful things will come out of this pandemic two years in, in two years but I think there is also an in, in incentive to for those of us who are working in these areas to sit down and say right how does this fit in with with our you know five years or you know two years understanding of this this very issue right and and so to be very blunt that the research was happening you know over the summer having google alerts constantly nervously reading about COVID and militaries having multiple alerts and and um and categorizing it and trying to make sense of it. And also speaking, you know, because I was also carrying on um, some conversations around the PhD, also in the back of my head, having kind of that um, background literature, theoretical um, literature also, you know, planted that seed and then trying to make sense of it. So bridging those two and making sense of it. But I was really well supported by my supervisors in doing that, I have to say. Uh, Fazio, I wonder if I could jump in and uh, press you again. Um, you raised a really interesting point in the paper about the issue of messaging and how, you know, we, we, we've we grown kind of accustomed to the militaristic language around this this pandemic. And yeah. I wonder what you, you make of that in the context of your typology, because I, I was wondering, looking at the typology, well, you know, have states had to make, you know, and governments consciously altered their messaging you know obviously there's a there's a large theoretical background to this you know, with politics of exception securitization all that but when you've charted the the different styles of engagements have you noticed significant differences in in the messaging and, and do you think that alters perhaps anything around you know the, the public acceptance of this convergence in in i think particularly in that blended area in that second category where there's kind of a lot of diversity and unfamiliarity to some of the responses I think it's that idea of the double-edged sword, isn't it? It's like, um, it has, you know, you see it in, in public discourse, it serves a certain purpose, it seems to work, it keeps people at home, etc. cetera. Um, but I think it's also, it can also be detrimental to the response in that you make, you know, COVID patients, for instance, feel um, like they're a threat. And more, so it has an absolute dual role. Um, and, and the fact that you see it in even completely, um, demilitarized quote unquote settings um, is really interesting. It's fascinating. Why do we use, right, as a speech act, like why do we use this language even without having recourse to, to the military? And um, mm -hmm. what does it give us as civilian institutions? I think that's fascinating. There's a, there was a, um, you know, I think we spoke about this, right? I was speaking to someone else about the bibliometric analysis that was done out of um, um, colleague, from colleagues who are associated with the, the research group at King's on, on conflict and health research. So bibliometric analysis will allow us to see kind of the transfer um, within studies right of, of, of capacity but we need to have discursive you know people discourses analysis of this also and try to say what what purpose does it serve is it working how does the media for instance um use this spins this because it serves definitely works with headlines um does it work in terms of um conflating or obscuring some of the inequalities and the social determinants driving these, these um, outbreaks. I think that's another story and we need more truthful narratives and we need to be, and that's also about data communication, isn't it? It's about academics being able to transfer complex, um, complex health data uh, mm. and nuance to the public. And so I think there's, a, there's definitely a simplification that comes in in terms of the way we frame in, in yeah, we frame the disease, yeah. Thank you. I think we have some more questions actually in the Q&A files here. Um, I, let me, you want me to, shall I read it? <laughs> it will be nicer for people. Oh, um, 
Yes. Um, um, and apologies if I'm getting the titles wrong. I mean, I'm, I'm only seeing the name, so apologies in advance. So this is um, um, a question or a comment from Adelicia Fairbanks. Uh, I was wondering whether your research has touched upon the role of humanitarian principles in civil military relations in humanitarian settings. And if yes, what some key findings were? Um, I've just started a PhD looking at community perceptions of civil military re relations in DRC Ebola um, and would love to speak directly at some point. So that's yeah. perhaps for, for both of you to, uh, to agree on. Um, yeah, thank you, Adelicia. Thank you for the question. And, and I would love to be in touch with you. It'd be, it'd be wonderful. Um, in terms of your question, so whether, uh, so the, the paper does reference the, the, the this is a, you, you and your research would have known about this and, and seen this again and again. I think the Oslo guidelines, which are the go-to guidelines and, and, and other guidelines and frameworks have been often deemed, right, um, inadequate for these interactions um, in humanitarian settings. Whether people know about them or not is al already contentious, but whether they're adequate or not is also a, an issue. And so, um, and so this is obviously replicated in what we're seeing in COVID-19. So the, the fact that there's no kind of frame of reference. So this is, this is an issue. Whether there's a paper that just came out actually, and I couldn't reference it in the paper because it wasn't out then, but there is a paper, a very good paper, um, which looks at some of the meetings that happen at Chatham Houses in the BMJ military it was just published by Sambol and I think um, Colin McInnes and, and, and others around the inadequacy of, um, of the current um, international frameworks for humanitarian and, epidemic, and in epidemics. So I would encourage you to have a look at that. I couldn't, yeah, again, I couldn't reference it in the paper, but I think, again, the COVID-19 mm -hmm. is just bringing impetus to these conversations. And so they will be revised and we will have, um, yeah, you, as, as you take on, I'm looking forward to hearing about your PhD, obviously. I hope that answered your question. Great, there is um, a, a question from an anonymous attendee um, who's not very confident about their question, but I think it's great actually, and I encourage everyone to you know share share with us their comments and, and questions. Um, so during military health intervention, is there concern uh, for sustainability, durability of these efforts? So looking ahead, is this something that we, you know this is a, an issue that is recognized as perhaps problematic in, in that intervention? Is military support in a health system meant to act as a temporary support mechanism or with the intent of this support being continuous? Should military interve intervention act more as an accessory uh, crutch to civilian efforts to the health uh, system or, or not? That's such a good question. And I think in, in the audience, there's a lot of people who might be able to speak to that. Um, I, 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 so I didn't, it wasn't my idea in the paper to take a position, right? I didn't want to say like this should, there's no, I don't know the way this should look like in, in practice per se. Um, I think there is, again, when you look at it at MIC, there are these continuous link. Um, and I don't think there's a value judgment to be done necessarily about them, right? Whether it's a kind of longevity crutch that then you care to, to replicate your language, which is very well formulated, by the way. Um, which so a longer crutch would then, which then kind of spikes up in 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 times of crisis. Um, so I think this is absolutely context specific. So in the UK, for instance, uh, there's been some recommendations made at parliamentary level around the way in which this should should um, happen. And I think some colleagues will have very clear views on on how this should unfold um, locally here, for instance. Um, so yeah, so I'm not sure to answer your question whether, uh, yeah. And the, the, the bit of the question, which is about the concern for sustainability mm. and durability, I think is really interesting because um, in a lot of those situations, because I think, and I don't want, again, I don't want to be controversial, but with the, re the security review, we just see that some of the political, you know, the, the way funding is pulled in and out, for instance, um, depending on, on agendas, um, on political agendas and visions, you know, really impedes the ability to, to act. And I think the UK is a really good example because it had such a strong global health security um, kind of overseas presence and thinking nationally and then kind of really failed in local uh, in, in, in local there was a mismatch between the two and so how do we make this a sustainable and continuum um 
yeah, should be at the center of our, yeah, our inquiries. Mm. I mean, I, I really found that last, uh, I mean, all the questions really interesting, but that last one also like rhymed with a discussion that is being, that is taking place in, in the UK about to what extent is some of the investment that is being put into addressing COVID-19 you know, could could be done in a more sustainable way. So rather than sort of like you know, inv like resources going to sort of general purpose consultancy work is just like invested in a in a perhaps just a kind of like a more sustainable way in a health system that would would carry these functions uh, forward. And therefore, like I I, I find that like you know, bringing that also to the military domain is something that would be sort of like interesting to um, yeah. to to think about. Absolutely. And I think when you look at that first trend, I mean, which has very little military involvement, it also has mm. very versatile primary healthcare systems, right? And so, yeah. and, and I think I say that the article says that in which we're, we've been thinking about it from a military standpoint often, right? So how do military intervene mm. within this realm? But actually, we need to think about what are the lacunas compensated and how might we eat them mm. up, really? Like, how might we make sure that we not necessarily have to invoke this ad hoc and come in? coming in um, in order to consolidate kind of more versatile community responses, I think, which doesn't necessarily involve ministry. Um, mm. Yeah. Um, the, the, I'm really interested in the military-led category, Fazia, that you mentioned. I mean, you, you include in, in, in the paper specifically like Indonesia, Philippines, Iran, Pakistan, Brazil, and Peru. Um, I mean, which, just like very different countries with very different political systems. And I'm just like trying to make sense of that collection. And I'm wondering whether you have thought about just like, how is it that these countries ended up in that category? I think it's more about the kind of power struggle between civil military relations and at what mm. point do the response in itself shifts, right? And so countries with military rules will, you know, will obviously have that only as a government. Um, but I think some of the, the, the ways in which the responses, especially in Latin America, have shifted, you know, as the epidemic kind of took hold. And I talk in the, you know, I make that comparison, um, which could, you know, the, the, the kind of delay in presidential understanding of the disease, for instance, would then has an obvious trickle down effect on military involvement, like just because it has an effect on contagion right so um as uh, and i give the example of burundi um the united states and brazil were mm. present were just you know, relentlessly um demean you know like belittling the the importance of the of the pandemic um and then led to, to kind of an unleashing of of local outbreaks um and so i think yeah it's really this idea of how what happens and i again this is a a typology but I think we really I'm, I, I would love I mean I would need a hundred lives to be able to do this but I think we need to be able and scholars will do it um, to be able to look at this palette that power shifting um, and at what point it happens in all these very different settings and again I kind of uh, stress that idea that we need those context specific insight but are there commonalities in the way um, there's not only, and that's what I go back about the push factor and the pull factor, is it that not only is it a lack of capacity or is it also when the military powers also kind of think, well, this is the moment to step in and also gain, um, and this comes back to our anonymous comments around sustainability. And so it will be really interesting to see in those settings whether three, four years down the line, some of the gains um, within the civilian realm will have rolled back out, right? Um, in various settings. Um, excellent. Um, I think we've covered a lot of ground. So let me um, give you uh, last two questions and comments, you know, get some reflections uh, on them uh, before uh, ending our very interesting uh, session. So the first is from uh, Professor Martin Bricknell. Uh, um, well done for your excellent work. I wonder if you also looked at the impact of COVID-19 on civil military relations in current areas of con of conflict. So, and there's some examples like uh, Mali, DRC, um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, um, etc. Um, and let me also combine that with the other questions so that you can have them both. Um, have you seen a decline in humanitarian military intervention after COVID, monetary-wise and otherwise? 
Okay, so two really, really good questions. Martin, thank you so much for the question, uh, Professor Bricknell. So I, I, that's such a good question. I think um, because as I was, as when, when Hassan asked me this very um, straight on question of how the research was happening and I was, you know, um, kind of, drowning in Google alerts and carrying the data. Um, a lot of these settings, as you know, um, more than me, will have had um, various journalists present, but very little data coming out of, um, of those settings. The place where I saw that one thing that I found really interesting um, in conflict and post-conflict setting is instances of utilizing um, the pandemic for propaganda. And so we, and so from, and non-state armed groups are obviously the elephant in the room of these inquiries. So, you know, we, if we think about it from a civil military standpoint, often we will eclipse these kind of um, non-states and, and other security actors involved in kind of um, incorporating these issues and also providing services, right? So I think this is happening. And um, there was very good work done at the ODI, for instance, on um, non-states art group and and their their um, their place in the pandemic in, in in the last year, and so my paper um, doesn't necessarily tackle these issues face front, but I think we'll have to we'll have to do it. It will be fascinating to see how that plays out. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the question by Nadine, which is around the decline, if I have seen a decline in humanitarian and military intervention after COVID. So this is a really good um, question. So I haven't seen, I'm not, I'm, I'm not the oracle on this. Um, I haven't, um, you know, I haven't looked at budgets, for instance, but I, but I have in, in, in looking at think tank and policy around these um, these issues. I think a lot of um, the geopolitical implications of the pandemic are going to be really interesting. And this is kind of a, some of the takeaway message of um, the paper around what does this mean for cosmopolitan militaries? Um, what does this mean for defense funding? And I think as we see austerity cuts, um, happening within civilian institutions, but also, you know, the, the Stockholm Peace and Research Institute predicted that there would be defense funding post pandemic and most obviously, um, potentially not necessarily everywhere um, where I stand at the moment, but in, in other settings, we are not the center of the universe in other settings. Um, and so I think this will be really interesting to see um, whether you know, how, what is the impact going to be like? And I didn't want to go too much into this in the paper because I didn't, then it, you know, then it becomes completely supposed, you know, it becomes a supposition really. Um, but I think you're, you're absolutely right in, in, in thinking that this, that the humanitarian military intervention um, landscape will change. Um, Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Fosea, for coming and sharing your excellent research with us. Excellent and speedy research that managed to make it to, to you know, to to to, to a publication in a in such a short uh, time span. Um, um, so thank you so much for coming and and joining you and joining us today, talking about your paper, but also more broadly about the topic and um, and how to do research in this very difficult space and time. Um, thanks as well for Gemma for, uh, for being an excellent discussion and sharing some of her thoughts and, and ideas on this and for everyone for coming in and joining in today some of the really interesting comments and questions that help trigger a very uh, useful discussion. Uh, well, I hope you all keep well. Uh, and hope to see Fauzea again, hopefully in a, we're talking about a, 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 another new publication soon. And I wish you all well and see you again soon. Thank you so much.